previous module we discussed about the various experiments on photosynthesis and you know that photosynthesis is autotrophic nutrition now in today's module we are going to see about a different kind of nutrition called as heterotrophic nutrition what are the various types of heterotrophic nutrition can you just recollect what i taught you about autotrophic nutrition auto means self trophic means nutrition which means the organisms are preparing their own food what is heterotrophic nutrition? Heterotrophic nutrition means the organisms cannot prepare their own food. Rather, they directly or indirectly depend on an autotroph. What are the different types of heterotrophic nutrition? Holozoic nutrition, saprophytic nutrition, and parasitic nutrition. These terms you already studied in your lower classes. Let us have a look into each of the different types of holozoic nutrition. Again, have a look at this flowchart. Heterotrophic nutrition is divided into holozoic nutrition, saprophytism, and parasitism. And all the definitions are given here. What is a holozoic nutrition? The organisms take in or ingest solid, whole, complex food. And they digest it within their body. After the digestion, the nutrients are absorbed and they are assimilated by the organism and the undigested food is eliminated a process called as ejection. So understand complex whole substances are consumed by the organism and the digestion is taking place within the organism's body. And this type of nutrition is found in humans, many animals and insectivorous plants. Now comes saprophytism. Saprophytes are organisms which feed on dead and decomposing organic matter. So they feed on dead and decaying matter it includes certain bacteria, it's not of course all bacteria, certain bacteria and almost all the organisms included in kingdom fungi which digest the food externally. Please understand the difference here. In holozoic nutrition, the complex whole food is taken inside the body and it is digested inside the body of the organism. While in saprophytism, digestion takes place outside the body and in inorganic substances are the broken digestive products are absorbed by the organism. So digestion takes place externally and the nutrients are absorbed. So I told you few bacteria and almost all the organisms belonging to kingdom fungi. Now let us move on to parasitism. This is a third type of heterotrophic nutrition. Parasitism, the organisms depend on a living organism. See here, just compare with saprophytism. Let us have a look at saprophytism. I told you saprophytism, the organism is depending on dead and decomposing organic matter for the food. But in parasitism, an organism is depending on a live organism, on a living organism, okay? So, obtain nutrients from living organism. The parasites obtain nutrients, you can see here from, highlighted here, living organisms, okay? And then, in this interaction, definitely, there will be a negative impact for the host. Because they are getting free lodging and food. Okay. So what are the organisms which are considered as parasites? A few examples. Fleas, lice, tapeworm. And you know many examples like Ascaris and all which you studied already in 9th standard. Now let us look a little more deep into each concept. Saprophytic nutrition. Already you know. You know some mushrooms are edible. So are all mushrooms edible? There are certain mushrooms which are poisonous also. What is the food for mushroom? How a mushroom is growing? Now you are able to say the mode of nutrition in mushroom is saprophytic nutrition. So what do they do? They are found on dead and decomposing organic matter. They pour out some enzymes. Enzymes are secreted outside. These enzymes are digesting the complex organic matter and break it into simple forms and they absorb these components. Then they utilize it. So it's extracellular digestion, saprophytism. So they feed on dead and decaying organic matter. Mushrooms, yeast mushroom and yeast belong to kingdom fungi. Now here there are images of few molds and mushrooms. This is just for uh, fascinating you. You can just have a look at different molds and mushrooms. Okay. All are sacrifices. Now let us move on to parasitic nutrition. I told you, you can very well remember free lodging and food. Okay. Now 
parasitic nutrition is a mode of nutrition where an organism lives either outside on the body of the another organism or within the body of an organism. So you can see here, it can be found either on the body surface or inside the body. Please understand these terms, body surface externally or it can be even found inside the body. The parasite obtains nutrition directly from the body of the host. So here host is a living organism, please understand this. Here I just brought an example just to motivate you. Here you can find sheep and a parasite. So here comes the concept of host and parasite. Sheep is a host, okay. Host is the organism which gives it free food and lodging for somebody else. Who said somebody else that some other organism we can call it as parasite. So here in this example, liver fluke is the parasite. Liver fluke is the parasite. The term indicates very clearly which part of the host is surviving. So it's actually found to develop inside the liver of the sheep. That's why we call it as liver fluke. So this parasite, can you just recollect you studied in 9th standard, belongs to which phylum, liver fluke? Is it cylindrator or is it platyhelminthus? Yes, it is platyhelminthus, flatworm. So it's a leaf-like organism and it is a parasite. So we know in this interaction or parasitism, there are two types of organisms, a host and a parasite. A host is an organism on which or inside which a parasite is surviving. So I, I hope you clearly understood what is a host and what is a parasite. Now, I, I just uh, brought in two concepts in the definition. It lives either inside or outside. The parasite is found either inside the body of the host or outside. So based on that, we can divide the parasites as ectoparasites and endoparasites. The term very clearly makes you understand without even an explanation from my side. An ectoparasite is a parasite which is found to survive outside the body of a host. And an endoparasite is a parasite which is found to survive inside the body of the host. So I hope you understood children what's an ectoparasite and an endoparasite. So I just brought here ectoparasite versus endoparasite. Ectoparasites are those parasites which obtain their food from their host by remaining outside the body of their host. For example, you know, if you have a pet animal, I'm sure that you know what are ticks and mites and all found on the dogs and cats and all, okay? And even a head louse is an ectoparasite, bed bug. So few examples for every concept you should know, okay? And uh, it is better to study the examples from your textbook itself. Even though there are a lot of other examples, from an examination viewpoint, what I suggest is, it's better to study the example first from your reader, then you can gain some extra information, okay? Endoparasites are those parasites which obtain their food from their host by remaining inside the body. So somehow they gain access into the host body. It could be any part of the body. In the previous slide, I hope you remember, I told liver fluke. Liver fluke is found inside the liver. There are some parasites like tapeworm. You study it again in platyhelminthus, which is found inside the intestine. It can be found in any part of the body, but inside the body. That's why we call it as endoparasite. So examples are ascaris, plasmodium, tapeworm. All these are examples of endoparasites. So can I ask you a question? What is the difference between ecto and endoparasites? Anybody? Yeah, very good children. So you understood the concept. Now, see, do we find any parasites in animal kingdom or do we find I mean, only in animal kingdom or are they found in plant kingdom as well? We cannot take that concept that plants are parasitic because we know that kingdom plantae is made up of autotrophic organisms. You studied Whittaker's classification by kingdom. They are autotrophic, they are multicellular, eukaryotic organisms. Then how come a parasitic plant? Everywhere there are some exceptions, you know, okay, any concept we say, we say there are some exceptions. Here also there is an exception that is a parasitic plant. What actually is a parasitic plant? This plant in the course of evolution, you know, underwent some modification, they lost the capacity to produce chlorophyll or they are not having chlorophyll. This plant is not having chlorophyll. You studied in photosynthesis previous module, chlorophyll is an important pigment, what is its role? Yeah, it's a photoreceptor, it traps the solar energy. So what happens if chlorophyll is not there? The plant won't be able to carry out photosynthesis. There's no food. 
So it has to survive. Okay, its basic life processes should go on. So this plant opted a parasitic mode of life. Again, in any parasitism, there is a host and a parasite. It is a host plant. So what is this parasitic plant doing? It just winds around the host plant. And it has got some special roots called as hostoria. The special roots are called as hostoria. With these roots, they penetrate into the vascular tissues of the host. What is the vascular tissue of the host? Can you say vascular bundle? Yes, children, it's xylem and phloem. Okay? So they penetrate into the vascular tissue of the host and they get ready-made food. Just like any parasitism, they are not taking anything from the soil. They just are winding around the support. They cannot uh, carry out photosynthesis. So they are just depending on ready-made food, which is provided by a host plant. So it winds around the host plant with a special root. It penetrates into the vascular bundle of the host plant and then just absorb the food. So this plant is called as cascuta. Okay? This plant, this example is very important from the examination viewpoint. Cascuta or we also call it as amarbel. Cascuta or amarbel. Many times for the board exam, they have asked, name a parasitic plant and a parasitic animal. So please remember, you have only one example to remember, though they are, there are many examples. You can just, no, no need of complicating yourself, you can just remember, Cascuta or Amarbel is one and the same plant. Now let us move on to a few examples just to fascinate you. You are sure, you know, ectoparasites. If at all you have gone for a trekking in a forest area, you know, without wearing proper stockings and all, if you didn't have an experience, you would have heard the leaves is biting and sucking blood. So it's not entering inside your body. So you can see it's just an ectoparasite. It actually bites it with a sucker and it releases out a anticoagulant. You know, our blood vessel has got a tendency to stop bleeding. Whenever we, hurt, we get hurt or there's a wound, blood will start oozing out of our body. After some time, it stops. Within five to six minutes, it should stop. Okay. So, but what happens for the leech? It bites and it breaks or, breaks or punctures the blood vessel, what happens? Blood starts oozing out. If our body ad adopts the mechanism of clotting and stops the blood oozing out, it won't get its food. So what it is doing is, it secretes from its saliva an anticoagulant. This anticoagulant will not allow our blood to clot. So blood starts oozing out continuously. Even if you pull out the leads from your leg, for some time the blood will be oozing out. This is because of the effect of anticoagulant which is secreted from the uh, leads. Okay. So this leads is an example of ectoparasite. Now ascaris, round worm. Which phylum children? Can you remember? Nematoda. Yes. Other name for Nematoda? Ashelminthus. Anyway, these are round worms. And this is ectoparasite. So I brought here two ectoparasites. Leech and ectoparasite. Pixel mites ectoparasite. And this is endoparasite, ascaris. Okay. Now let's move on to the third kind of nutrition. This is really important. Why I brought it last? Because this is the kind of nutrition which is found in animals. Holozoic nutrition. What exactly is the definition for holozoic nutrition? Holozoic nutrition is a type of heterotrophic nutrition that is characterized by intake of complex whole substances, a macromolecule, which could be either in the form of liquid, gaseous or any form. A complex whole macromolecule is taken inside and then internally it is processed. It's broken down. The processing takes place in five steps. We'll see that. Actually, it's broken down and digestion. So many processing is involved here. So here, it can take either in the form of gaseous, liquid or solid particles and then they process it. What are the organisms which carry out this holozoic nutrition? Protozoans like amoeba and most of the free living animals including human being. Understand, our mode of nutrition is holozoic nutrition. We are not a parasite, we are not a saprophyte. We are heterotrophic of course, but our mode of nutrition is holozoic. Now, I told it's internally processed. What are the steps involved in the processing? We'll just have a look. Uh, an organism adopting holozoic nutrition, taking complex organic food. And then that process of intake of complex organic food is called as ingestion. Ingestion spelling is very important. I-N-G-E-S-T-I-O-N. Okay, ingestion. It is a process of intake of food materials. In case of holozoic nutrition, food is ingested through the mouth. It need not be always through the mouth for all the organisms. Please understand. Some organisms have different methods which I will be showing you in the next slide. Okay. 
For some organisms, we procure food through the mouth. There are different mechanisms, but somehow they ingest the food. Next, digestion. So digestion, I already taught you in previous module. It is happening with the help of some biocatalyst enzymes. So a complex, something which is complex is broken into simple inorganic substance. A complex organic substance broken into simple inorganic substance. This is called as digestion. Okay. The next step. After digestion, it has to absorb it. Otherwise, it cannot utilize. So the digested product is absorbed into the bloodstream. Think about human being itself. We are eating food ingestion. After eating in our elementary canal of food pipe, it is being broken into simple inorganic substance. If it's not absorbed, it will be excreted out, I mean, ingested out. Okay. So we, we have to absorb it. So after digestion, it has to be absorbed into the bloodstream. The process of utilizing or absorbing whatever is important for a body, that is called as absorption. You can think like that. If you can't remember the definition exactly, understand the meaning of what is absorption. Process of absorption or intake of digested, absorbable form of food through various methods and then it has to be used. The next step, fourth step is, see we are just absorbing it and we are not utilizing it. What is the use? We have to use it. For example, proteins we take in, we ingest, it is digested into amino acids. Amino acids are absorbed into the bloodstream. If amino acids are just like that in the bloodstream, what is the use? It has to be again converted into protein and used for bodybuilding. That is called as assimilation. Okay. So whatever is absorbed is being utilized for something. Bodybuilding or energy, making of energy or whatever it is. That's called as assimilation. Now in this process, finally there will be something which we really, you know, uh, is a, a digestive remnant or waste product we can say. In this process there will be something which is left out, a waste. This is called as a digestive waste. Okay. This digestive waste, our body has got a mechanism of expelling out. That is called as ejection. So it is the removal of waste materials. Okay, the waste material is due to digestion. All these processes, for example, digestion. After digestion, just try to recollect. Yes, absorption, then assimilation. After assimilation, you know, there are something which we really don't want that is being thrown out of the body. It's called as ejection. Okay, now let us move on to Holozoic nutrition in amoeba. I told you it's a mode of nutrition. I explained all the steps. You can just have a quick look at the diet. This amoeba, it is a unicellular protistant. Okay. It, it can sense a food molecule in its surrounding medium. It sends the food and it extended its pseudopodia. It is an organism which is not having any shape. It can acquire any shape. It extends its pseudopodia towards the food and engulf the food. It engulf the food. And the food is now taken inside a vacuole. This vacuole has got digestive enzymes. Okay. So this food is, digestion means, you know, it's broken down into simple forms. After the process, third step, ingestion, then comes digestion. After digestion, the digested components are to be absorbed. So it's a unicellular organism. It's just absorbing into its surrounding cytoplasm. That is absorption. After absorption, I told, it has to utilize it. That's called as assimilation. It assimilates it. That, which means it's utilizing, okay. And in this process, I told some waste products, some digestive waste products will be produced. That it, ha it cannot retain in its body because it's, it's not at all needed. Something which we don't want, we won't retain our body, will not allow for that. So they adopt a mechanism, to just throw out the digestive waste, which is called as ingestion. So children, please remember the various steps. Ingestion, digestion, absorption, assimilation and ingestion are the five steps of holozoic nutrition. Now this is just, it's lunch time for an amoeba. So it's just, you can visualize in the surrounding medium, there are some food particles. So amoeba is engulfing the pseudopodia, this is pseudopodia, brought in the food particle. It took the food particle inside, into the food vacuole. This vacuole has got some enzymes which will digest it. Then all the other process takes place, it utilizes, it absorbs, assimilates, ingests, etc. Now, what is this organism? Can you just recollect? It is paramecium. We call it as slipper animal cule. Slipper animal cule because it is of the shape of a slipper. Animal cule means a tiny animal. But now we know, so this is a term, but you should understand it's not an animal. Which I call clearly classified and put this organism in protista. Okay. But still we call it a slipper animal cule, a tiny animal which is taking the shape of a slipper. Why you may be thinking why ma'am is showing this paramecium diagram? We are just going to compare the mode of nutrition in amoeba 
and paramecium. Both are holozoic, but in amoeba I told you, amoeba extends its pseudopodia. If it is towards its left side, it extends towards left side. If it is in the front or anterior region, it can extend towards the anterior region, any side. Wherever food is late, excess pseudopodium engulf or ingest the food. Is it the same method for uh, paramecium? Paramecium has got locomotory organ. This is the locomotory organ. The locomotory organ of paramecium is cilia. It's not one cilia. There are so many cilia throughout the body you can see. So locomotory organ in amoeba was pseudopodia. But in paramecium, it is cilia. Okay? It's not just one cilia. There are many cilia. The cilia actually collectively beats. It beats together and brings a ciliary movement. So when it's beating together, you can understand it will swirl the water or a water current is formed. So if any food particles are there in the surrounding, it, that is brought. It just swirls and it's brought towards the paramecium. Through which part will it take the food? Is there a pseudopodia or anything like that? It cannot do that. There's a definite place, a specific position or location for the paramecium to take in the food. And that is called as oral groove. Something like a mouth. You can see in amoeba, it could take food anywhere. You can extend the pseudopoda, take it anywhere. But here, in this particular organism, paramecium, there is a specific place. We cannot call it as mouth. Mouth is only for a complex organism. Here we can call it as something like a mouth. Oral means something related to mouth. Oral growth. The food, you know, it's, it's, it's swirling because of the ciliary movement. The water forms a current. And it's just taken to a driven towards the oral group, food is taken inside. The thing is, only the mode of ingestion is different here. Understand? Only the mode of ingestion, otherwise, all the other steps are same, like holozoic nutrition. So, whether amoeba or paramecium or human being, the mode of nutrition is heterotrophic and it is holozoic. The only difference here is in the amoeba, amoeba could take food through any side of its body because it's not having a definite shape, no specific organ as such. But for paramecium, there is something. A particular region through which it ingests food and that is called as oral growth. Now it's time for evaluation student. What you have to do is whatever concepts I taught you, read thoroughly and take up a test. Let us have a quick look at the questions. Draw a neat label diagram of holozoic nutrition in amoeba. Now I think without even reading your um, textbook, you can visualize all those diagrams like which I showed you and you can just draw straight away. Remember all those five steps and just draw the diagram of amoeba. Draw a flowchart for the various types of heterotrophic nutrition. I brought colorful charts, flowcharts, so you can easily remember it as holozoic, yes, parasitic and saprophytic. Differentiate between parasitic and saprophytic. Can anybody tell the answer? You have to write it as a homework, okay? Parasitic and saprophytic. Parasitic organism depends on living or dead organism. Can you just tell me? Yeah, it, it depends on a live organism called as host. What about saprophyte? Saprophyte depends on a dead organism. Okay students, in the next module, I'll be teaching you something very interesting. Heterotrophic nutrition and it is holozoic nutrition. But we are going to learn something about ourselves. Namaste.